Wrap your arms around with your mercy. I give up on doing things my way. When you say give me a ring, you really meant a ring, huh? Turned out to be more than just a fling, huh? Three hours to get back from Palm Springs, huh? Who you know spend an hour in Walgreens, huh? You know you'll always be my favorite prom queen. Even when we in dad's shoes and mom jeans. Too many complaints made it hard for me to think. Would you shut up? I can't hear myself drink. We used to do the freak like seven days a week. It's the best collab since Taco Bell and KFC. Uh, talk to me nicely. Don't come at me loud. You had a Benz of 16. I could barely afford an Audi. How you gonna try to say sometimes it's not about me? Man, I don't know what I would do without me. Billionaire sport. Step up to the court. They rented a room. We bought the resort. God got me, baby. God got the children. The devil run the playground, but God on the building. Time went silence, a luxury. Cussing at your baby mama, guess that's why they call it custody. God got us, baby. God got the children. The devil run the playground, but God on the building. Time and space is a luxury. But you came here to show that you still in love with me. Starting to feel like you ain't been happy for me lately. Darling, remember when you used to come around and serenade me? Oh, but I guess it's gone different in a different direction lately. Trying to do the right thing with the freedom that you gave me. Your gun of safety. Speak first, don't break me. Words, you're angry. Lord, don't take me. Oh, oh. Wrap your arms around with your mercy. I give up on doing things my way. solitary confinement. I didn't even think it was a book when I started. The Lord provoked me to just write as I was going through the experience. And so what I was thinking during this writing, I was crying, I was laughing, uh, I was scared, I was confident, uh, I was encouraged, I was discouraged. All of that poured out of my soul onto the pages of this book. And so people oftentimes say, well, you know, Quan, what was it like in there? You know, what, what were you going through? What was you thinking this book is that? off the grid, his transparency, his vulnerability, his relatableness. This book is not just for adults, it's for young people too. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, family. Good morning. What's happening? How's everybody doing? Y'all come on up in here today. Good to see you. Okay, it's already people on deck. All right, Rochelle. Good morning, Regina. On deck first, as usual. Good morning. Good morning, Regina. Good morning. Good morning, Rochelle. Um, good morning, Deanna. Good morning. Lisa Marie is here. We can start early. It's, that's good. At least Marie's on deck. We can start early. That's good. That's good. Good morning. Good morning, Gloria Ware. Good morning. Good morning, Cheryl Sanders. Good morning. Good morning, everybody from Facebook. I wish I could see the names. I cannot see the names. Steve Taylor. Good morning, brother. Good to see you this morning. Stephanie Jones. Good morning. Big Ed. What's up, baby? <laughs> good morning, brother. Good morning. Hey, Leticia Maria. Hey, baby. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Y'all come on in. Katrina, good morning. Good morning. Shyanta. I like that. Shyanta, good morning. Good morning. All right, everybody. Good morning. We're going to have a great Bible study this morning. 
we're going to talk about when religion meets relationship. Yeah, what happens in that confrontation, that engagement, when religion meets relationship? Yeah, we're going to talk about it today. All right. Well, y'all come on in. We know we always give our people a chance to put their feet on the side of the bed in the morning. Yeah, not y'all that's already at work, that's already in the car, that's already moving and grooving up. You've already handled the kids. You've already done your thing. You've already worked out. Not y'all. We're talking about the people who are putting their feet on the side of the bed this morning. Those people. We waiting on them. We give them seven minutes. Yeah, seven. We give them a hard seven. Deborah, good to see you this morning. Everybody come on in. Good morning, Apostle Lee. Good morning, sir. My main man. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So that's good. That's good. Now I got I can I can go. I got to get myself together. Apostle Lee is here. So let me get myself together and all this kind of stuff. I, I, I really don't have nothing here today. No, no notes today. We're going to see what the Holy Spirit is going to do today. Is that all right? Is that all right? When religion, I got my scripture uh, going to be up on the screen. Uh, you know, I got you covered. I always had you covered with the scripture. Oh, um, they're telling me again, remember, don't forget to like and share this message. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we're going to have some upcoming events um, very shortly. Um, we're moving on purpose. We're moving on purpose. Things are, are, are opening up. God is pushing us, compelling us, and provoking us to continue to move uh, forward. Yep. Thank you, Apostle. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I want everybody to know, yeah, please like and share this message. I'm supposed to be doing all kinds of stuff they keep telling me uh, to do. All right. All right. There we go. So now, now we got something going. Okay, let's get going. You know, I don't like to do this. I don't like to wait. All right. They say wait two more minutes. Okay, two more minutes. Um, what's been happening? Let me just tell everybody. Everybody's been sending me um, uh, um, questions in the on the social media. Um, the job that I have is executive director of an organization of nonprofit foundation called Taking Action for Good or TAG. T-A-G, Taking Action for Good. Uh, we have three prongs of our organization very quickly. One, we go out and try to get people uh, commutations, paroles, I mean, commutations, uh, pardons, and, and uh, compassionate releases, mostly in the federal space. Um, Alice has done some great work in, in building relationships in the state government space. And so she's starting to move in that space very well. Um, Bishop Battle, good morning, good morning. Akila, good morning, good morning. And, and so she's moving in the state space, has met with some governors and moving in that area. Um, but what we have now moved into is looking at legislation. Kwame Kilpatrick, that I love it. I love the fact that we can go and, and participate in producing positive public policy, uh, things that, that are strong and good for, our, for the people of this state and the people of this country, whatever this state may be. Uh, we were in Tennessee last week in Nashville at the state capitol meeting with the governor and some state legislators, uh, and it was very positive. They have some bills going through the legislature there that are also, I mean, just absolutely awful, excuse me, awesomely awful. Yeah, they're horrible. As a matter of fact, they mirror the 1990s bills here in Michigan, truth and sentencing and all of that, you know. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, they're taking away the age requirement for um, a person to be able to go to adult prison. So you could be young as 12 and 13, like here. Remember Nathaniel Abraham here in Michigan and went to prison, a grown folk prison in 13. And as a person who was in a state prison and I saw 15 year olds come in, it's a savage place for somebody 15 to come in that door. It's, it's, it's horrible, y'all. And this is not the place to tell those stories. But I also seen a 30 year old man who got there at 15 and the savagery, yeah, yeah, I meant that word, uh, that I've seen uh, performed by some of these people who are corrupted by that process uh, is, is absolutely abominable. So um, if we have any idea of re reform or transformation or a newness of life or a new opportunity to live, uh, a lot of those folks that get trapped in that system at 13, 14, 15, 16 years old uh, don't come out of that system well. 
Amen. So uh, we are fighting those bills. So that's my job. Okay, now it's 8.07. It's time to do this. Marcia, Big Ace is in the place. Uh, Apostle Caldwell is here. We can definitely take off today. Ain't that good? Today we're going to talk about um, when religion, yeah, 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 yeah. When when religion meets relationship. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation of this is is um, there's just more power in relationship. Yeah, people want power. Yeah, they want it. People want to be unafraid. People don't want to be scared no more. People don't want to live in fear. People don't want to walk on eggshells. People want to be bold. Well, you got to move out of religion into relationship to get it. And we're going to talk about when religion meets relationship. I'm going to be in the book uh, or the letter or the epistle called Acts. Mm -hmm. Malik, rah, what's up, baby? David Cooks speaks. All right, I love it. Thank you for coming on in this morning. Minkita, we could really start this morning. Let's go. Let's, let's take off. We in Acts 4. We in the verses uh, 1 through 13. So you all bear with me in reading this. I don't have, oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's going down. No, no, everything's all right. I, I thought I didn't bring my glasses. All right. No, no, everything's all right. Yeah. Yeah, I got glasses. So we going to, you ain't got to bear with me. Just pray for me. Amen. Good. All right, we're in Acts 4, verses 1 through 13. Let's go. Let's take off. Let's not stop until God uh, shows up, changes hearts, provokes and compels people to follow him in a relational way that produces power in the kingdom of God. Is that all right? Amen. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. They were confronted by the priest the captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees. We don't talk about that. Verse two, these leaders were very disturbed. They were grieved that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there's a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them. And since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. While they were sitting in jail, the number of the men who believed now totaled about 5,000. Hearts were being changed. Lives were being changed. Minds were being transformed. Five. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Religion got together. Six. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, we remember him being the high priest uh, when Jesus came through. John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples, Peter and John, and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man who crucified or the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone or the chief cornerstone. Verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Verse 13, this is when religion recognizes relationship. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special theological degree, accolades, or understanding or training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Today, we're going to talk about when religion meets relationship. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for a Friday morning. 
I thank you for allowing me to put my feet on the side of the bed this morning and wake up in victory. Lord, I thank you for the victory that I'm moving from, not some victory that I'm chasing. I thank you for relationship with you. For when I went to bed last night, I absolutely knew that you would regulate my mind, my heart, my blood flow, my vessels, that you were with me, in me, around me, for I live, move, and have my being in you. Now, Lord, allow me to decrease so that you may increase so that the men and women who hear this message will be absolutely provoked and compelled to hear you and not just me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen, everybody. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, they say it again. Don't forget to like and share this message. Let's go. All right, here we go. Um, let's start here. The book of the Acts. I, I, let's set the table. Y'all know me by now. Acts, the book of the Acts. We understand that there's a New Testament and an Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, there are all these letters that are being written, right? They're these letters. Once we get to the epistles, after we pass the gospels, we get to these epistles and their letters, most of them written by an apostle named Paul. He wrote Romans, Corinthians, uh -huh, Galatians, Philippians. We understand that there were churches in Philippi and those letters were written to the churches in Philippi, present day Turkey. We understand that he wrote letters to the churches in Corinth. We understand that he wrote letters to the churches in Rome. Those are easy for us to understand, but what is the Acts? There's no place called Acts. There's nothing in, you know, there's no churches in Acts. So what, what is this Acts thing? When we come to the book of Acts, this is a epistle written by Luke. Luke that wrote the gospel of Luke. A lot of people go to theological seminary and become Luke and Acts scholars. They focus on the writings of Luke, the teachings of Luke, the great physician who was given a charge to follow Jesus, walk around with him. With, 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 with all of his folks, all of the apostles, to interview them, see what they were doing, follow them around, and report back. This book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. It's Luke writing about what was going on with the apostles, what was going on with them as they move forward after Jesus' death. So it's the Acts of the Apostles, and we're soon about to learn it's also the Acts of the Holy Spirit. As they moved, lived, had their being in Christ, the Holy Spirit had its day. Acts 1. What happened in Acts 1? Acts 1, the resurrected Christ was on the scene. He, he was there. He came and came to those disciples. They, they, had, they had been all saddened and everything. He had just died. You know, remember in the end of John, he had to go get Peter, restore him, bring him back in. And now he put them all in one room and he taught them for 40 days. Good morning, everybody. For 40 days, the resurrected Jesus stood in front of the apostles and taught them for 40 days. He taught them, the Bible says, the kingdom of God. He taught them the structure. He taught them the processes. He taught them the value. He taught them um, the, the, what is the kingdom of God. That was his teaching. His teaching was to make sure that when he left here, that they knew everything that they needed to know about the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. He also told them at the end of chapter 1, that I want you to stay right here. Don't you go nowhere. Y'all don't disperse. Y'all keep, y'all stay together because the promise of the father that I've been talking to you about called the Holy Spirit, he will come into the earth and he's going to come. He's going to come. He's, he's on his way. I need y'all to stay here till he gets here. Don't teach, don't preach, don't do nothing until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He told him that. And then after that, go on ahead, go to Jerusalem, Judea, go out to the Ottawa, go everywhere, but wait here. 
chapter two opens with the famous scripture that you've heard preached by pastors all over the world. Um, that 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 they you know if you grew up in a church. Um, in a Pentecostal church, there was lots of hollering and screaming and running in this scripture. Uh, when they were all in one place on one accord, suddenly there was a sound, ooh, a sound from heaven that came. Right? Remember, it was the inauguration of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Penta, 50 days. Yeah, Penta, 50 days after Passover, the Jewish community celebrated this big feast. That feast became Pentecost, 50 days after the after the brutal crucifixion of the Lamb from God, we celebrated Pentecost, foreshadowing the Christ to come. Everything in the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the Christ to come. The Lamb that was slain and the blood put on the doorpost and so the, the death angel would pass over that house. So all of the first sons were saved from the edict put down by God and that all of the, all of those who didn't have the blood of the lamb would be slain. Those of us who have received Jesus as our Lord and our savior, we've also received, we also were died with him in the blood that he shed. I now have protection from the death angel. He passes over me. He passed over me in prison. He passed over me in my shame. He passed over me in my adultery. He passed over me in my wickedness. He passed over me in my lying spirit. He passed over me. And then yet I was also raised with him to new life. Amen. I could preach it. I'm telling you, I could do it. I can do it. I ain't going to do it here. So what we're doing is we're in Acts Two now with the inauguration of the Holy Spirit, the sound from heaven. It was like tongues of fire. People started speaking in other languages. People were able to understand each other. This person was Greek. That person was Cyrenian. This person was from somewhere else. They were speaking in their own language, but they were able to understand one another. What is this? And Peter, yeah, Peter, the, the apostle, the disciple who was just denying Jesus, shaky, flaky Peter, who went and said, I'm through with all of this, it's been one, I'm going fishing. God restored him through Jesus Christ. He came and he said, hey, 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 feed my sheep. Yeah, remember that? Remember we said, go get the disciples and Peter. I got something for Peter to do. Peter is here at Acts 2. He stands up and he preaches the inaugural sermon of the Holy Spirit. These are not drunk, as you suppose, but this is that which is prophet. Y'all know the scripture, right? By the prophet Joel, he talked about that. Then he went right at him. And 3,000 people joined the church that day. And then we move right into Acts 3 when the church now is born. Remember, God came to Moses in Exodus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Remember, the children of Israel wouldn't go to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Remember, it was burning with fire and, and it was real scary. And even if an animal touched it, it would die. And Moses was bold enough to go and meet God, but the children of Israel wouldn't go. So he had to be the mediator. Oh, there it is, between God and man. He was the Old Testament mediator, and he went to the mountain to talk to God. But now Mount the God is sitting on a new mountain called the church. And he's coming down off the fire and tons, all this kind of stuff. And now we have a mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. But now we have access by faith in him through to God. And so now it's not a mountain that you can't touch. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's the it's the heavenly Jerusalem. It was the Hebrews twelve. Thank you, Lord. All right, so I, I'm, let's just keep going. I want to let's not get over the. Thing. We had Acts three. In Acts three, we start seeing the true acts of the apostles. They're now moving on purpose. They're preaching, teaching, healing, and they run into a lame man, a crippled man who was sitting in front of the temple. Just like Jesus, they was going right up in the old religious spaces and preaching Jesus. They were bold. So the first thing I want us to get from this is you can't run away from church. 
No, stop it. That ain't that's not who you follow. You can't run away from people who bad people. Jesus had far more conversations and miracles wrought with people who weren't in covenant relationship with him. And he kneeled at the well with a woman who would be considered in modern day as a whore. The centurion soldier, he saw faith in him that he marveled. He only marveled a couple of times. He marveled at disbelief and he marveled at this centurion soldier who just believed his authority and understood it and he healed his daughter. We see he had time for people that didn't have covenant too. He also had time for people with covenant. Blind Bartimaeus, oh, son of David. He had a covenant cry. Remember, he had a covenant cry and he healed his eyes. So he didn't have big me's and little you's. He didn't have, ooh, we the church folk and y'all not. Jesus didn't do that. And so his disciples didn't do it either. His disciples. One thing I love, Apostle Caldwell is here. One thing I love about him, if you call a co Apostle Caldwell and say, hey, I got a, a guy, he is, he needs help. He's strung out on drugs. He, he, he don't know the Lord. He needs some help. Apostle, send him to me. Give me his number right now. He own it. He's on it right away. He ain't trying to hear about his family lineage. He don't know what church he go. He don't care nothing about that. He's on it. That is who we are. And that's who these apostles were. They're in the streets talking to the people. And then one day they make a hard left and go over there to the temple. They said, let's go talk, them, talk to them about Jesus. When they get to the temple, it's a, it's a man laying down in front of the door. He ain't walk. He's been there years begging for money. He look up at Peter and he say, I need some money. You know, help a brother out. You know, give me, help me out. I mean, give me something, baby. Come on now. I mean, I've been out here. You know. Y'all seen it before. I don't care what city you're from. That guy was out in front of the temple. And Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And he, he, he made him look at him. Look right at me. And he, put, he said, rise up and walk. And the dude got up. Been crippled his life whole life. He got up and said, oh my goodness. And the religious people witnessed this. The people saw it, but the religious people witnessed this. And instead of being joyful and wondering about this amazing thing, they got mad. Why? Because people was being delivered and healed. Uh, uh, people going to be mad at me. Listen now. This is when religious people get upset. And I need to make this. Everybody with a church is not a religious person. Don't make that assumption. Everybody that has a church building and they actually doing the work of the ministry inside a building, don't accuse them of being religious. That's unfair. We see in all these Instagram things and all of this stuff. And even I saw one of the gospel artists mention that it's just all whacked and the church is whacked and all this kind of stuff. The church of Jesus Christ could never be whacked. Never. And certainly, as certainly as there are human beings that are, are, are in churches, some of them called, some of them not. There are going to be some problems, just like they're human beings at restaurants and human beings in the movies. And so, so when you go to one church, you can't make an indictment on all churches. And let's stop doing that because we're killing ourselves in this narrative. Jesus said, my spirit testifies. Well, actually, it wasn't the Paul. Paul wrote in Romans that my spirit testifies with his spirit that we are children of God. When I walk into a building or when I meet a pastor, there's something in me that, that marries itself to something in him or her. And then I know, hey, she, she knows the gospel. He, he knows the God. He knows Jesus. She knows Jesus. Let's not get caught up in, in the modern day thing that the church is horrible, it's whack, it's this and that. Stop it. 
because there's somebody, they need that building. And all the enemy had to do was whisper to you to start dogging the building. All right? Okay. All right, good. We talk a lot about horrible this and horrible that. Yeah, but there's some people out there doing some amazing work in the ministry. And I've been to hundreds and hundreds of churches. And I could tell you one of the first thing, most churches are small churches. Most of these pastors are spending their own money feeding the homeless and the hungry and clothing the naked. Overwhelming majority of the churches in this country, white, black, I don't care, Mexican, whatever, they doing the work of the ministry with very, very little money. So what they do is show you 20 pastors that's making millions and that becomes the church. And what I want people here to know is that is not the church. The church on Linwood and on Dexter and on Gratiot and on Van Dyke and in South Central and in South Philly and the church that's right there in Compton, that church been there for years doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with gang members and, and going to bail people out and, 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 and resurrecting life out of dead places. And I need people to understand, I don't, this wasn't even a part of my message, but I hear it too much and I've seen too much to be quiet about this. Certainly there's some jack leg folks out there, ain't no question. There's places where God does not live, but God lives over there at Apostle Lee's church. Yeah, he lives there. Yeah, go in there and get you a prophetic word. He, he lives over at World Changers with Apostle Lee. He lives uh, at Jeff Battle's church right there in Atlanta. Yeah, you better go over there to Riverdale. I'm trying to tell you. I, I've seen it with my own eyes. Amen. Okay, that was, that was just that. So we got to stop doing that to each other. All right, here we go. So in Acts 4, the people come and lay hands on them. Yeah, not lay hands on them in a good way, like putting their hands on them and anointing them. No, lay hands like in the neighborhood. Yeah, they put them hands on them and they arrested them. They took them to jail and they had them sit there overnight while they decided, you know what? Um, uh. We should kill these boys. Yeah, it was about to be a kangaroo court, just like Paul in Philippians, just like Jesus. It's a kangaroo court. We just got to get rid of these people. And our scripture picks up right here. This is where we, we start, right here. So really quick, we're going to go through this. I'm telling you, 20 minutes, I'm going to head you out of here. Stay with me because I believe God has a blessing for you. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus Christ, there is resurre resurrection of the dead. First of all, we got to look at who came on the scene. The priest. I'm talking about the, 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 the reverends in the church. Yeah, in the temple. Yeah, the religious folks, Pharisees, the, the, the guys who ran the rabbis the priests. They came out there and said, what are you doing out here? Preaching this Jesus crap. These were the same people who just 60 days ago or something, we got to understand time periods. They're now moving on purpose after spending 40 days with the resurrected, resurrected Jesus, waiting 10 more for the Holy Spirit to show up. They're now moving on purpose. Jesus was just crucified uh, a couple of months ago. This is not a long time ago. These were the very same people who were persecuting him. Remember, they in Jerusalem. We read right here. We right here in the theater of it all. This is not later chapters in the Acts where they were moving all over the uh, European world and they went into Paul went on into Turkey and all that. We still in Jerusalem. This is just two months. These were the very same people that locked Jesus up. These were the same people who believed that when we kill him, his disciples going to scatter because that's what the word said. It said that they scattered. It, it also said in John that a, a whole great deal of them, they followed him no more. They were watching people leave this Jesus. And after they 
terrorize him, brutalize him. After they had his guts hanging out, Isaiah said his ventricles were hanging out. After they put these large stakes in his wrist and his feet, after they beat him unmercifully with the cat of nine tails, after they hung him on the cross and he was bleeding and he was dying and he hung his head and died. After all of that, these people at a temple in our neighborhood preaching Jesus. You got to get this. The priests were there, but also the head of the temple guard. That's a Roman appointed position. That's a Gentile. So the Jews and Gentiles loped up. Yeah, yeah, just like they do with you. Yeah, that's why nobody like you on your job. Oh, you talk about Jesus way too much. You're getting on everybody's nerves. Yeah, not just the church folk in there. The religious people mad at you. Yeah, they don't want to hear nothing else from you. The Gentiles, folk that don't know God, they mad at you too. And then you got these other believing religious people called Sadducees. They don't believe in, believe in the spirit life. They don't believe nothing happens after that. There ain't no resurrection from the dead. So I don't even know why they was mad. Why would you be mad? They out there preaching Jesus in the resurrection. They should be like, man, these people fools. But I tell you, people cannot agree with you, think you're crazy, and still not like you. <laughs> they still want you off the scene. Why? Because you're speaking truth. When you're talking truth, lies hate you. Lies in religious form. Lies in the worldly form and lies in these special kind of sects of religion. They all hate you. What is truth? The better question is, who is truth? Jesus said, I am truth. We always say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We say that all the time. I will, no, no, I am the way. Stop right there. How, how do we get there? What's the way? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, listen, you are going to have haters. And the reason I'm spending time here is because the only way that you can operate in this relationship, and this has been preaching and teaching for me this week. Good morning, Unc. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Steve. This has been preaching and teaching for me this week. You can't do this without being bold. You cannot do what God has commissioned, purposed, and destined for you to do without being bold. And yes, you're going to look crazy sometimes. Yes, you're going to look weird sometimes. You know what it's like to have a 28-year sentence? and telling everybody you'll be out in seven? From the third year you got in, the Lord told me I'm getting out of here in the seventh year. Everybody in the prison knew it. They came to the chapel. I preached it. I taught it. I told people. I sat down, talked to them, Ask the Lord. Ask him. He'll tell you what it is. You know, they was whispering all over me. I know, I know, I know. The old man, I know, I get it. They were telling you, they were talking, he was nuts. Dude done lost his mind. He going to do that time. <laughs> and people, hey, Quan, people tell me, tell me you going to do that time. <laughs> I would laugh. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're going to look weird sometimes. All of us, and this I'm preaching to me, y'all. All of us that are afraid of looking different, afraid of, of what people might think, there's no way we can operate boldly in this, in this calling. So the first thing you got to, set, to, know, to settle in your mind, I got to be bold. And here's the problem. And I'm going to move quickly through after this. I need you to hit this point. Most of you were bold when you really were crazy and didn't have a covenant. I used to go on TV and say, you can't beat me. Crazy. Come to Christ and get soft. Then you turn into a straight cream puff. 
Oh, but that's not the Jesus we serve. That's not these disciples who are the foundation of this ministry. These people were bold. Do you know that they, when they was on the way to the temple to preach, they absolutely knew and had settled in their mind that we might die for this? What do you believe in? You've heard me say this before. People don't like it when I say it, but I say it because I mean it. I had a tremendous amount of respect for the gang members in the prison. They were really willing to die for that nonsense. But they was willing to die the same. They understood commitment in a way that Christians haven't seemed to understand. It was so easy to talk and evangelize to a crip or a blood or a GD or a vice lord. It was easy because we could talk about commitment. What set you claiming? Who you down with? Where you where, where you standing? I've watched men stand against four or five guys with knives and stand up and hold their ground for color, not for Christ. Not for Christ. See, we got a hater on here. That's awesome. We ain't had that. That's good. So then, what we do is we just keep being bold in what we want to do and what we're supposed to do for the kingdom. Amen. 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 So we go back to our scripture and we see that these leaders have all got together. They arrest them. They throw them in prison. Verse four says, but many of the people who heard the message believed it and the number of men who believe now totaled about 5,000. So the church is growing. 3,000 have come. 3,000 have come out of, of, of what happened at Pentecost. 5,000 now are there, just a, another chapter in. They're moving on purpose. They're going, they're moving, they're growing because of the boldness of the disciples. Let's keep going. Let's get there. The next day, the council of the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas. What, we, what you know, Caiaphas was the high priest when Jesus was coming through the same process. Remember, Caiaphas was one of the men who uh, conspired with the Jewish uh, rabbis to kill Jesus. And now we know from history that Caiaphas and also um, Annas, they kind of traded back and forth uh, the high priest during that time. So in some of the writings, you're going to see Annas, and in some of the writings, you're going to see Caiaphas. But they were both trading in those positions, keeping the power of that position uh, and for several years. And so they sat there together. They got the Sanhedrin together because the Sanhedrin is wondering how did these people start preaching and teaching again this Jesus Christ? And I want you to see what they asked them. It's very interesting. They, 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 they brought the two disciples and demanded, verse 7, they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? They was already out there watching them preach at the temple. They absolutely knew whose name they were preaching in and by what power they believed they were preaching in. So why did they ask them the question? They asked them the question to make a mockery out of them, to, to, to actually shame them to see if they would do something criminal, like lie. Uh, we were just out there preaching because we were, by no name, we were just standing there. We, we, we were just saying, now listen, now I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Um, how, how, how did you get out of prison? How, how did you get off the deathbed? How did you get out of the bed of suicide? Um, you know, I was just, you know, I just kept doing my, I just kept filing paperwork. I just kept doing things I was supposed to do. Man, the doctor, man, that doctor was so good that he got me out of that hospital. They want them to deny Jesus so they can be held in contempt. 
By what power did you get off the sick bed? By what power did you get out of the crack house? By what power did you stop being an alcoholic? By what power and whose name did you get off the bed of suicide? It's very important that we're able to answer that question. This is man's court. The religious court is always going to try you. I, I, I get it all the time. People walk up to me, you know it wasn't Trump that did nothing. And it was it was God. Who you say got you out? People ask me that all the time. I say, ma'am, for 200 days, in a solitary confinement cell, I was praying the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he could turn it whichever way he pleases. Lord, please turn President Trump's heart towards me. You got to understand, ma'am, I've never met President Trump. I've never talked to him. I didn't know anybody in his cabinet, but I knew the king. And the Bible says that the king can turn hearts. The Bible said that a man's gift makes room for him before great men. So I just believe that the king, when he breathed his word, he remembered that I would also believe him. It's important for us when religious people come up, not just worldly people, it's religious people that sometimes we need to talk to about reconnecting in relationship with the king and not religion. Yeah, because I know you ain't been in a cell. I know you better than me. But let me tell you about the king that I got. That I can call on him from the inner parts of the prison. How about you? Do you know him? Do you know him? How did you get out? Or are you still in? Are you? It's important for us to be able to answer this question. I think the enemy sometimes, they give us the absolute roadmap to victory by being ugly. Who, I, what power and in what name to you out there? I'll ever get them. They won't say Jesus in front of us. Yeah, they won't do it. We big and bad and we could kill them at any time. They won't say it. You know by what name. Let's see what Peter says. Peter says, filled with the Holy Spirit. So this wasn't the Peter that was shaky flaky. It was another man. That's what he said about Caleb. He, he, he got another spirit. Yeah. Are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Stop right there. Um, shaky, flaky Peter got another spirit. Mm -hmm. We saw the boldness in Peter in his, in his crazy life. Why? We saw him cut off the ear of somebody coming to put their hands on Jesus. And in the very next scene, we saw him denying Jesus. Just like us, we are absolutely bold in one moment and then absolutely fear in another. So don't dog Peter unless you look in the mirror. This is one of those moments that he needed something else. And he was working, walking and operating in the spirit of God. And when he stood up, it was another spirit speaking through him. Okay, come here, Jesus. Do not think about Rehearse, talk about what you will say in that moment, but the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. There are some moments in life where he must speak through you. Let him lead you. 
don't rehearse. If I ever go to court, this is what I'm going to say. If I ever go, if they ever ask me, no, don't do it. Oh, Kwame, you could really speak good. Um, well, how you do that? Yeah, yeah, there are techniques and tactics of doing public speaking. But sometimes you just got to let the Holy Spirit use you. Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. All right. For Jesus is the one who is referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you build is rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's in Psalms 118.22. I love, you know, um, the writers of the New Testament didn't have a New Testament. The writers of the New Testament used the Old Testament to have the revelation of Jesus, which is why the last few weeks we've been in the Old Testament. We're coming back to the New Testament now. But if you don't understand how profound the Old Testament is, the didactic teaching and learning and, and, and the ability to see Christ in scriptures. Oh, oh, OK. Ruth had a kinsman redeemer. Oh, I get it. That's Christ. Oh, you had to bring a lamb without spot or blimp. Oh, that's Christ. Oh, when the when the when the uh, uh, priest went behind the veil and, and and there was the mercy seat and the ark of the covenant. Oh, he was. Oh, you got to see Christ and everything. And when the revelation came to these Old Testament prophets, teachers, apostles, and and disciples, they shared it with the world. And we now have more revelation because we're looking from the other side of the cross, just like these people in the Acts were. Hey, man. Hey, Deidre, you keep believing. You keep believing. Hey, man. All right. Number 12 or verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. Peter's still talking. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Here's the part where we get iffy -o. This is it. We've come to the place. Peter makes a bold declaration of exclusivity. Peter says there is no other name under heaven by which men, mankind, shall be saved. I can't call on no other name. Now, here's where the breakdown happened because every religion claims exclusivity. I, 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 um, I used to marvel at the boldness of the Muslims, not just in prison, but outside of prison. The boldness and the discipline when they did what they did, they, they carried it on their sleeve, on their shirts, on their chest. I marveled at the five percenters, always evangelizing, makers on the screen of the planet Earth, five civilization, God of the universe, make it make sense, make it make science, mathematics. I marvel at how they approach people and talk to them about it. I marveled at the GDs. I marvel at the GDs in the midst of Crips and Mexican Mafia and all the different gangs, they represented their set. I'm going somewhere. They didn't try to merge in with everybody else. Yeah, they ain't try to do that. You couldn't wear no colors in the joint. You just had to recognize them by the set they was claiming. But we as followers of Jesus Christ are typically not that bold. And what turned me off about people who were in church and stuff back in the day was the lack of boldness. They presented Jesus as this soft, kind of androgynous looking skinny figure. He was always weak, had the long hair, and he was always dying. He was always dying. Or he was sitting at the Last Supper and he was just peaceful. I didn't read for myself 
So I couldn't understand how I, this big old black dude from Linwood and the Boulevard that played basketball and football and, 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 you know, went out and, and I wanted to conquer the world. I could not understand how I could follow that. And it wasn't until I was locked in a prison cell that I actually was able to dive in the scriptures for myself and the author of the scriptures start talking to me. I start seeing him for who he is based on the word in the book, not based on the word that I heard screaming from a pulpit. Every good preacher, teacher, evangelist, apostle, prophet, they want you to know this word for yourself. As a matter of fact, if you receive a prophetic word, it should land on something inside of you. It's very important that you know him for yourself. Why do you stand up for your mama? You know her. Why, if somebody come in and try to get your wife, that's your baby. No, that's my wife. You epic gnosis her. There's an intimate knowledge. It's not a gnosis. It's not a pantsing thing. It's not something that just know. Okay, all right. Do do you know? Um, uh, uh, hey, y'all know uh, Mike Duggan in Detroit? Yeah, I know him. He the mayor. Yeah, I know Mike Duggan. No, I ain't talking about that. No, I'm talking about like you know your wife, your son, your daughter. I'm talking about like you know your husband. It's an epic gnosis, not just gnosis. There's an intimacy in the relationship. There's a protection you receive and give. There's something that forces you to speak up. There's something that makes you shout, leave him alone. Don't touch him. Let me tell you about who he is. There's something that happens inside of you, not around you, that forces the boldness. So it's not just a teaching. That's why it's no other name. It's not no, there's excellent teaching in Islam. Excellent teacher in Buddhism. Yeah, don't nobody like when I say this. That's all right, come with me. There's, there's, there's great teaching. Oh man, peace and time. You ever read any of those? I, see, I, I've, I've read it all. That's how I know there's no other name. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I know, because I had to go through it all. I wanted to investigate it for myself. I didn't want to hear it from nobody else. I didn't want to say because I was a politician. You got to understand, I operated as well in the Muslim temple as I did at a Christian church. I operated as well when I went to the Buddhist temple as I did somewhere else. So it didn't matter. I didn't have an affinity for any of it. I didn't have any hatred for any of it. It was all cool to me. Everything was cool. I can mess with that pastor or that pastor. It didn't matter if he was liberation theology and he was Pentecostal. Didn't matter. Didn't understand it anyway. All I wanted to do was get in and get out. I did not know for myself that there's no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved. And we get to the point when religion meets relationship, that something happens. My wife was telling me that the things that I was doing, I bought flowers and all this kind of stuff. You know, I did all of the stuff you supposed to do when you're a husband. And I didn't see her happy. She wasn't smiling or nothing. I'm like, I bought flowers and everything. And she named about five things that I could have did that would have resonated. And I understood I was handling it in a religious way. I was doing the things that you do when you're a husband or you a person that has a mate, but I wasn't intimately involved with Leticia. I'm, I'm trying to give pictures here before we close out in two minutes because the next line is why it's important. Why is it important that you understand and know the name and what's attached to it? There's power in a name. When you hear a name, it says something to you. 
when you hear Denzel, oh, image comes to place. You understand whatever your relationship is with that. You hear Oprah, you hear it, you hear it. Michael Jackson, you a name, a name, a name. There's no other name by which men shall be saved. So wait a minute. When I hear Jesus, is he the big fella upstairs? Is he the white guy on the cross? Who is he? When I hear Jesus, is he just religious? And here's the breakdown for us. However, that name lands in your spirit determines how much power you have in the name. So you get to verse 13 and you see when religion meets relationship, religion has to bow down. The members of the council who had the power to kill these two men were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. How can they not be afraid in front of us? How can they not uh, deny Jesus in front of us? How can they do this in the face of us who have the power to crucify them just like we did they boss? For they could see, these men could see on this council that they were just ordinary men. They didn't have a degree. They didn't go to Harvard. They didn't go to theological school. They had no special training in the scriptures like we have. But the last part is the big one. They also recognize that these men had been with Jesus. Religion sometimes doesn't like you because they know you've been with Jesus. And when you've been with Jesus, there's boldness, there's supernatural intelligence. People that don't have a 12th grade education can speak mysteries and wisdom and knowledge and understanding that people absolutely can't fathom how they got it. Because religion likes to control. Relationship is all about freedom. There's a cataclysmic shift when religion, when religion meets relationship today. If you don't do anything else, I want you to take some time to get to know the power in the name of Jesus. Because today, I want to push you over the edge so you understand that everybody will be able to see Jesus in you when they see your boldness. It's time for you to get off the bench and get into the game. And right now, we need the relationship-driven soldiers on the field. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for continuing to be God in our lives. Lord, I just thank you for um, showing up here today. Lord, I pray that you have blessed someone. I pray that you have edified someone. I pray that you have encouraged and inspired someone here to be exactly in what you've destined for them to be. There's somebody here who's been feeling a little intimidated by some circumstance. And so, Lord, I pray that you would provoke them and compel them to move forward in spite of what they see as opposition. Help them to know that you've already gone before them and you with them and you got their rear guard. You even in the room when they leave out, when they talking about. Them. So, Lord, I just pray that people today would be encouraged to move in absolute boldness because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, open up the windows of heaven for our blessings on the lives here that they won't have room enough to receive. And we'll always be careful to give you the glory and honor in Jesus name. Amen. Man. All right. I went a little over my time. I thank everybody for coming today. I hope somebody is encouraged today. Amen. 
Um, thank you, Sherry. We appreciate you. Deidre, thank you for coming. Everybody on Facebook, thank you so much for stopping by today. I truly appreciate you. I can't see the names. Darnell, good to see you, brother. Align with Christ, good to see you. All right. You can support our ministry at Cash App, Move Mental 120, Move and Mental, one word, Move Mental 120 on Cash App or Zale, Move Mental 120 at gmail.com. Move Mental together 120 at gmail. Uh, listen, 120, what is that? That's January 20th. That's the year that I walked out of the physical prison and into the next part of purpose and destiny that God has for me. And so that's why it's there. Amen, everybody. Thanks for coming. Have a wonderful weekend. If you're somewhere warm, get on outside. If you're somewhere cold, go outside anyway. All right. Yeah. Don't even worry about it. All right. Love y'all. Uh, good to see everybody. Earlene, good to see you. Uh, Cuz, Abdullah Akbar. Ali. Good to see you, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ace in the place. Thanks for stopping by, dear brother. All right, y'all. Y'all take it easy. Thank you so much. Glory be to God. Peace. Merlo. Shades. Warfare. Fight night. About to make the devil go night night. The red and the J's like brake lights. 98 might when I take flight. I done turned up, I was turned down. Used to get swept in the first round. Only take steps with a slight now. Billy Jean might wear a turn round. This ain't just sit for me. I ripped the kingdom and I spit it lyrically. Got revelation and had an epiphany. That's when it blew like I got it from Tiffany's. Yeah. I'm just a vessel. Built on a rock so I win when I wrestle. You're still a killer. My father won't let you. Jesus G. Human at 33 special. Yeah. Don't got a college degree. Honestly, God show me favor when I'm making moves. So it ain't hard as it seems. Once he decided to promote you, he breaking the rules. Once meant for me is for me. Life hit me with a denial. I'm playing it cool. That's because the promise in me. He wiped up my biggest blemish and made it anew. Lose my shackles. Freedom. Freedom matters. Boost my shackles. Freedom matters. Can't spend my whole life in bondage. On point just like C. Thomas. So lost, but I knew you find me. In all your perfect timing. Boost my shackles. Freedom matters. Boost my shackles. Freedom matters. Can't spend my whole life in bondage. On point just like C. Thomas. So lost, but I knew you find me. In all your perfect timing. Boost my shackles. Kill my ego. Just like Moses, free my people. I'm revved up off the scripture. I done took my eyes off the pictures. Cause what it seen is just temporary. Plus it wasn't my sin to carry. I done jumped off the porch. Peace that came off the leash. About to go back to back with heat like when Brian came out the east. Sheesh, I done lock picked the handcuffs. I got both faith the man up. I see black boys with hands up. We need backbone to stand up. Strengthen us mentally. I know the enemy get at us physically. Favor surrounding me so he can get to me. I know I'm bigger than one ever sent to me. Yeah, I'm just a vessel. Built on the rock so I win when I wrestle. You still ain't killing my father won't let you. Jesus G. Hillman at 33 special. Yeah. yeah.